Welcome everyone to the classroom. Finally, after two years of the pandemic, we are now after Easter back in the classrooms. And today we are talking about sustainability. Earlier, we already had our open plenary session on sustainability at the university. And we talked a little bit about what is going on in our research, teaching, transfer activities with regard to sustainability. What we are doing now in this session, uh, we are going to talk a little bit about how practitioners and students contribute to the sustainability strategy of the university. And we are very happy to have you here with us, also the ones who are here in Zoom. There will also be a recording of this session for those who cannot be here with us live. And of course, we are also very welcoming your feedback and your comments about what we are doing. We have a couple of really, really great speakers with us here today. And one of them is on my one of my oldest, uh, I would say, friends in Mannheim and practitioner collaborators. When I came to Mannheim in 2015, Apu Gozalia was one of the first ones who contacted me and said, hey, I'm so happy that there is now this chair working on sustainability topics. Let's do something together. And since then, Apu has really been an active contributor to basically everything that is going on at the university teaching level in sustainability. And uh, I'm really, really grateful for all the contributions you're making. Then uh, roughly two years ago, I would say two and a half, maybe, I contacted you and I said, we are planning a new master program on sustainability. And Apu, uh, together with, for example, also Talke, who was here in this session earlier, um, we had a group of practitioners who actively collaborated with our chair to design this master program. So there is also a lot of Apu's thoughts and input in um, the teaching at the Mannheim Business School that we are offering. At the moment, Apu is focusing after 20 years of being at Fox Petrolop and really pushing the topic here locally um, in a company. Now at the moment, you are very active uh, at the Senate of Economy and your role is Head Climate Neutrality Council, right, of the Senate of Economy. At the same time, you are also consulting companies. You are working um, as a consultant at Focus Zukunft. Um, and maybe I can mention here that Focus Zukunft has also supported us at the university level. Uh, when we calculated our footprint, we are still collaborating at the moment with Focus Zukunft to uh, conduct our own emissions accounting. Very grateful for that uh, support as well. And last point, and then I will hand over to you. Uh, <laughs> Apu is also a lecturer at the Mannheim Business School and at the faculty. In our master program, um, Apu is teaching the course decarbonization, climate change and decarbonization. And this is also climate neutrality and decarbonization. And this is also the topic that you are going to talk about today in your keynote in the session. And what we have done is we have brought a student that has been participant in your class, Jan Niklas Alves. And um, this is a participant from the class yet that you have been teaching not at Mannheim Business School, but at the faculty. We also have two participants here um, who actually participated in the MBS class. So we will hear from both sides today. Um, but um, there is one difference between these audiences. At the Mannheim Business School, uh, the students participate as practitioners and they uh, apply their knowledge to their own companies. At the faculty level, our students apply the knowledge that they learn from people like Apu to the university. And this is very, very helpful for us, right? Because students like Jan Niklas can then directly contribute to the strategy development around sustainability at the University of Mannheim. With this, I will talk about the other speakers later, but with this, I would like to hand over to Apu and then Jan Niklas to share some of your work with us. Thank you for being here. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. Laura, it always feels great. It always feels special when you come back in your own hometown to your own university. I started studying here, believe it or not, 30 years ago in the year 1992. Actually quite uh, shocking to realize that, yeah, and uh, quite unbelievable. And there is, you mentioned it briefly, there is also another coincidence, or let me say, I can even say cosmic significance today, because believe it or not, and uh, it is true, I gave my first presentation uh, on the topic of sustainability in 2016. That was on the occasion of the so-called CSR weekend, CSR Wochenende. Uh, Laura, that was the first time we met. And it is to the day, believe it or not, you can look it up. Uh, surprisingly, it's still on YouTube, this talk. 
2,222 days ago. Yeah. And that's a fact, yeah. And uh, so a little bit of coincidence. So yeah, climate change and decarbonization. So um, I mean, whom should I tell that? We are living in definitely challenging times. And I'm quite sure that past generations may have also said, well, it's very challenging the times we are living in challenging times because we have to deal with three issues at the same time. And um, I mean, I don't even want to mention the word, but uh, we have to deal with this. Talking about cosmic significance or coincidence, there is of course a tragic coincidence even today because um, two years, two months and two weeks ago, that was the 23rd of February, 2000, the first two people in Italy sadly died due to COVID. That was also the day, 23rd of February, when the Italian authorities closed the borders to major cities in the north. And so, yeah, and we are living with it since more than two years. The second thing, and uh, a tragic coincidence once again, 23rd of February, 2020, COVID. 23rd of February this year was more or less the last day, and it was indeed the last day where we still all hoped that there will not be a war. And one day later, 24th of February, you know what happened. Russia attacked um, Ukraine. So um, we have to deal with the one crisis, which is not yet fully over. Maybe we'll have just to live with it. We have to deal with the war. And uh, if that is not enough, we have still got a third issue. And that's the topic we are all talking about. And that's uh, the climate crisis. Yeah? And um, yeah, I certainly believe that um, the first two crises, more or less, we can deal with it because it's more or less, a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less under our control. The last one, surprisingly, we can also still change some things, but we have to face the fact, and I'm quite sure you all know it, certain issues and things are irreversible, cannot be changed anymore. We can just try to live with it and try to find our way through. So it is not my intention, definitely not to get you all depressed yeah, in, this, in this session, because, uh, but we have to face the facts. That's the first thing. There have been two very important reports by the World Climate Council, the IPCC, Weltklimarat in, in Germany, which have been released in this year, one in February and one in April. And the bottom line in a nutshell, what these reports say is that, yeah, we are in a difficult situation. One of the findings of the first report was that 3.3 billion people, that's 40% of world population, are now significantly in a bad condition. Most of them are in the less developed countries due to climate change, very vulnerable. And um, the second thing that they found is that however bad the situation is, we still have a possibility of about nine to 10 years till the end of this decade to change certain trends. So that's hope which is there. And um, the third thing is that they said that whatever we do, we have to start now. There is nothing, and that is all of us, not only students, companies, institutions, and there is a clear pathway how to do so. And uh, what did they say? What are the dangers that we face in these times? I mean, I'm quite sure you know all about that because otherwise you would not be following and attending this session, but we have reached a certain limit uh, in our societies where we have got this so-called tipping points in the climate systems. And you just look in the news of the last one and a half years, then you know what happens. Flood, fires, droughts, uh, um, climate change in the Arctic and so on, melting of ice, uh, permafrost and everything that we have. What name is? So we are definitely at some tipping points. And uh, just to put it into perspective, because it always seems like, okay, we have this and we calculate this. What does it actually mean? When I talk about drought, for instance, there are 12 hectares, 12 hectares of new desert, which come into existence every minute. So in the last five or six minutes, or maybe nine minutes that I talked, yeah, you can do the mathematics by, by yourself. And that is equal to 15 soccer playing fields. Yeah? So it's always sometimes important to put it into perspective what it actually means, what is happening. And uh, talking always about cosmic significance or coincidence in, in a sad way, this slide uh, I'm showing since two years, the fact that in countries like India, which is on the right-hand side, uh, in more than 50 years or almost 50 years, we will have temperatures and they will be living in regions in India as hot as the Sahara. And it was coincidentally not last week and not next week, but in this week, 
where you watch the news, what happened, yeah? Heat waves in India and everything. So this is material and uh, it's really happening. Yeah? Some people still say, well, it always was there. You know what the discussion is and that is not man-made and so on. Yeah, it is man-made to a certain extent, anthropogenic, as we say. And uh, we can convert all of this to a phenomenon which you also quite definitely know, which is the so-called Earth Overshoot Day. Just for the record, what is Earth Overshoot Day? Earth Overshoot Day is that particular day in every year where we have consumed so much from the planet that he cannot regenerate the resources we have consumed up to Earth Overshoot Day in the given year. Or to put it in other words, it's that particular point in time in each given year where we are living beyond our means. Or to say it financially to the financial guys, it's that point in time when you've got your bank account, you stop living from the interest, but you cut in the fundamental basis of your account, which might be possible for a certain period of time, but at some point in time, you end up with zero. And if you look at the development of Earth Overshoot Day, which was measured for the first time significantly in the year 1971, that was the year of my birth, but believe me, I had nothing to do with that. Yeah. And if you see the evolution, the interesting part comes at the end. So in 2019, before COVID and anything else happened, Earth Overshoot Day was at the end of July, 29th of July. And if you look at the chart, the, um, the green bar, the light green bar in 2020, we came down by one month. That was unintentionally due to COVID. We are not flying around so much and everything. But that gives me the signal that what can happen unintentionally can also happen intentionally if we proactively change things. Yeah? Unfortunately, in the year 2021, to the day, uh, we came back to the same level that Earth Overshoot Day had before. That was the 29th of uh, July. And um, to put it into perspective again a little bit, we also have country overshoot days. And that means what would Earth Overshoot Day be in certain countries if all people would live on the planet like in that particular country? And I hope it can be uh, detected the first Earth Overshoot Day, country-specific Earth Overshoot Day, uh, is already passed. It was 10th of February this year in Qatar. And remember, I showed you some um, soccer playing fields and everything. When you think about Qatar in this year, you know that at the end of the year, there is the World Soccer Championship in Qatar. And uh, how do we call the World Soccer Championship in Qatar in this year? It's a catastrophe. It's really a catastrophe. Yeah? We can laugh about it, but we cannot do anything about it. How stupid, honestly, to make that in that particular location. In any case, talking a lot about coincidence, it was not last week and not next week. It was day before yesterday that Earth Overshoot Day occurred, country specifically in Germany, 4th of May. And uh, to talk a little bit about uh, Germany again, if you convert it, what does it mean? If we would all live on this planet like the people in Germany, we would need the resources of three planets or Earths to satisfy our needs. And you can see how it is for the, for the other countries. So once again, I mentioned there were two reports from um, the IPCC in this year. This is the April report, the final report in the series where they said that the average annual greenhouse gas emissions were at the highest level in the past decade. But I also said, I don't want to get you all this depressed. There is also a little bit of hope because they also said in the same report that the growth rates of CO2 emissions came down in the last years. Yeah? So that means we can still change something. And it was in second report where they said nine years of time till the end of decade, the decade to change some processes to um, change fundamental things in businesses, in institutions, in universities. Um, I will come to that. And um, now everybody talks always in these days about CO2 emissions, CO2 emissions, CO2 emissions. Don't get me wrong. CO2 emissions is not everything when we talk about sustainability, but without CO2 emissions, everything is nothing. And why do I say that? Because global warming and the fundamental basics of what all of this what is happening can be converted and goes back to the fundamental CO2 concentration and the increase in the past decades. And it's for me one of the slides where I always try to look five times. And this is 10,000 years 
the, the bar below means 10,000 years. And if you look at the development of the concentration, the fundamental increase just occurred in the last 70 years. So in the last 70 or 60 years even, uh, from the end of the 60s till now, the CO2 concentration increased by 30% alone. So if you get into discussions with people who say there is no man-made climate change or it's not anthropogenic, of course it is, yeah, to a certain extent. And um, so we emit, all people on this planet, 150 million tons of greenhouse gases per day. It's an unbelievable number. And the second thing that is uh, important, and interestingly, we always talk a lot about, about responsibility. Yeah? The, the climate change report from the IPCC also said that not only are 40% in the less developed countries uh, particularly in danger, they also said it is much dedicated to the not taking responsibility of the rich countries who just didn't do what they had to do in the past years. And that is true. And we had yesterday an interesting session at this university um, to the honor of Professor Rafé, which by the way was, um, who passed away unfortunately last year. And it was my first professor in marketing when I started here. And the discussion, Laura, you were also there, was very much on responsibility. And here we come again, it's about responsibility. If you look at the CO2 emissions per capita, uh, and in this chart, it's the uneven distribution, which is also a problem. So to put it in words, the rich 10% of world population in the Northern hemisphere and the Western hemisphere, are responsible for 50% of the global emissions. And the other half of the world population are only responsible for 10% in the less developed countries, but have to suffer most from the CO2 emissions. And that is what we have to do and what we have to tackle, which has not been done uh, in the past responsibility. And that gives or puts me to the four most important um, decisions and results of the very famous and known to you Paris Agreement of 2015, where now after the re-entry of the United States, all nations have joined, aid for the poorest countries in coping with the damages that is our responsibility in the Western Hemisphere of companies, of institutions, and so on. Then they say no further pollution of the atmosphere from greenhouse gases in the second half of the century. And they said we need to limit global warming to not only two degrees, below the level of the pre-industrial age, but even 1.5 degrees. And that's also what the IPCC said. And just to show you some slides on that, that's why we have this road to zero from countries and from regions and nations. Germany just uh, put up uh, or lowered um, the target to 2045. The European Union wants to be carbon neutral by 2050. And you can see it's quite an interesting chart uh, what the um, commitment of the other countries and regions is. And uh, this is the second, for me, always very interesting chart. Uh, and if you look at it, uh, sounds or looks a little bit complicated, but it's actually quite easy. And the message is, if we hadn't had the Paris Agreement, then we would look at a CO2 emission rate in the year 2050 of 1,600 billion tons. Just look for a second. It's not what 1.6 billion tons, it's 1,000 600 billion tons, an unbelievable number. Yeah, And uh, then we had the Paris Agreement. So that's the blue or I think uh, light blue curve that brought or will bring emissions down by 500 billion tons. But the important thing is, do you see this uh, on the right hand side, the, um, the red arrow? That's what I call the so-called ambition gap. That's the ambition gap because we need in order to get 1.5 degrees still to lower till the year 2050 for about 500 to 550 billion tons. And this commitment cannot come from politics that has to come from the private sector, from institutions, from organizations, definitely from companies. And here you can still see voluntary contribution. This is changing now and you can feel it because with the voluntary contribution, we are not going anywhere, which we have uh, um, witnessed in the past year. So now the pressure is increasing and everyone can feel the pressure is increasing. So uh, just two more slides. The name of the game is what I like to call the 3C approach is, before I talk about 3Cs, let me talk about 3Ms, what you cannot measure. It's in every business field. What you cannot measure, you cannot manage. And what you cannot manage, 
you cannot modify. So the name of the game in the beginning is, and Laura also just mentioned it, and this is true for any kind of institution, not only for companies, for organizations, for universities, calculate your CO2 emissions. You just mentioned I've got different clients right now, and I still sometimes don't understand. We're not talking about carbon neutrality and cutting down. That's also important, but I'm so surprised sometimes that companies say, oh, we don't know our CO2 emissions. We have not calculated them. That's the fundamental basis to calculate your emissions, to detect and identify your top emitters. And that's why I'm very happy that we started this approach with the students and nice to hear that we may continue. That's the name of the game. The second C is then of course, develop strategies to cut down your emissions. Green uh, energy or whatever, you can reduce your company car fleet. Or that many measures any kind of institution can tackle in order to cut down emissions. And at the end of the game, the problem is every person, every human being, every institution will always reach a point where you've got unavoidable emissions. Yeah? No one in this room, no institution can live totally emission-free. That's a fact. And it is, of course, no greenwashing. If you, because it's always said, if you compensate the unavoidable emissions by investing into climate protection projects, where? In the less developed countries. And in this way, you prevent them from emitting more CO2. And now don't get me wrong. I don't say, and I never say that uh, compensating is everything. It's part of the game. It always needs to be a mix of things, yeah? But we cannot, we don't have time anymore. We are buying ourselves a little bit of time. It's like a bridging technology till we can change our processes that we really emit lower CO2. I've got one example from the year 2019, which I want to share with you. Um, Volkmar Denner, that was at that point in time, the, the CEO of Bosch, one of the biggest industrial companies, uh, became carbon neutral. And he got, yeah, I can say this here, a big shitstorm from the uneducated public, honestly, because they told him, oh, you are greenwashing yourselves, you are compensating. And he said, no, it's quite easy. I'm, uh, I'm a CEO of one of the biggest industrial companies in the world, and we will change our processes. We have got strategies, battery production, everything. We can lower our CO2 footprint level by 80%, but it takes 12 years. I don't want to be a burden with my company to the climate for the next 12 years. So I do two things at the same time. I put myself carbon neutral by compensating. And at the same time, I develop the strategies in order to sequentially come down. And unfortunately, we cannot wait and do it step by step. We have to do all three things at the same time. That, that's just the name of the game. And uh, this is my last slide coming back actually to the beginning. I mean, when, when we talk about sustainability, you always very often hear about the so-called three Ps of sustainability, which is, as you know, profit, planet, and people. But quite personally, and this is again, the circle back to what you kindly mentioned to myself and coming back to this um, university, um, I've got my personal three Ps and they stand for passion, pleasure, and purpose, that's really the way. And it was passion, pleasure, and purpose to come back after some years to this university again, and uh, having had the opportunity to teach and to lecture young students on climate change, on uh, decarbonization and all of that. And I will just have in a couple of seconds, this is really my last slide. Jan Niklas, this was one of the first cohort of students, which I had uh, the pleasure to um, work with. And he will also talk, I, I believe a little bit about emissions and green mobility and uh, so on. And last but not least, this is a sustainability festival. And I think it's just great that it takes place at first festival. And in German, Nachhaltigkeit to me also means Spaßhaltigkeit. So when we are done here, go out there, enjoy yourselves, drink something, there is music and everything. And uh, that is allowed. Yeah? Nachhaltigkeit is also Spaßhaltigkeit. Thank you for listening.